الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو الأقضة من لساني يفضل طالي Jazakumullah khairan brother for uh, giving an introduction and uh, kicking off the session. The topic that I will be covering for this session is Sahaba, that is the companions of the Prophet وسلم, before their conversion. So the title is Sahaba before conversion. What I want to discuss through this session is three aspects to this subject. The first one being the greatness of the companions of the Prophet, the greatness of the Sahaba as as their position as their stature in islam because before even we have the audacity to speak about them even before we shake our tongues about their goodness and their weakness uh, it is important that we make certain prerequisites clear to every one of us the second uh, aspect that we will look into is their lives before islam came to them so the errors the weaknesses or what you call the disobedience and the sins the mistakes that they had before Islam came to them and before they entered Islam. And then the third aspect, the final one, we would see how when Islam came, although with all their weaknesses before Islam, the moment they entered Islam, the moment they decided to submit their will to Allah, they became absolute obedient slaves and servants to Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the lesson that we're going to take home uh, from, the, from this discussion, inshallah. So as I said, the first one, let's see the first aspect, which is the greatness of the Sahaba. First and foremost, I want to make this absolutely clear to every one of us here and everyone who is going to be listening to this uh, session later, uh, later on, inshallah. The first and foremost point to be known and understood is the companions of the Prophet, the Sahaba. They are so great. Their position is so high. They are so beloved to Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that even the least obedient companion of the Prophet is much more superior than the most pious amongst us. Even the least obedient amongst the companions is best and superior in all regards and aspects to anyone who is even the most pious amongst us today. So there is no comparison, in other words, between us and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. One warning I would like to give along with this. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which is recorded in both Muslim and Bukhari, so it is uh, muttafaq alayh, it is narrated um, uh, in, in, by both the narrators, and they have mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet said, do not revile my companions. Do not revile my Sahaba, for by the one in whose hand is my soul, if one of you were to spend in charity gold equal to the size of Mount Uhud, he would not achieve the status of one of them, not even come halfway. So the Prophet ﷺ made it explicitly clear that there is no comparison between the companions of the Prophet and anyone who is going to come later. To the extent that Prophet has warned and said that do not revile my companions. The scholars, they explain that the, to revile the companions is to abuse them, to put them down, to think that you have a status equal to them or you are superior to them. Any abuse against the companions of the Prophet is absolutely unacceptable in the religion of Islam. So it is very important that before we discuss the weaknesses and the sins and the errors and the mistakes of the companions of the Prophet before they entered Islam, even to discuss that, it is necessary that we have this frame of mind that we are not talking and we do not have the right to put down even a single Sahabi, even a single companion of the Prophet. So that is just to give you a brief of that. Moving further to the second aspect, which is the errors, the sins and the mistakes or the disobedience and the weaknesses of the companions of the Prophet before they entered the religion of Islam. So we're not talking about uh, their, their weakness before they were aware of Islam, but we're talking about why they did not embrace Islam or Islam did not reach them. We're talking about a stage before that. One more aspect I would just like to mention here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 137, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدِهْتَلُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if then they, 
that is the disbelievers if then they believe the way you believe that is referring to the prophet and the companions so who were the early and the first muslims that were the companions of the prophet so once the companions became muslim and the disbelievers including the Bani Israel and the Nasar of the time, they were now abusing the companions of the Prophet by saying that how could Allah choose these poor people to be the chosen people of God? How could it be? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them and warning them, if they believe, that is the Jews and the Christians and the, and the disbelievers, if they believe as you believe, that is the Prophet and the companions, then they are indeed on the right course. So look at this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the pathway that Allah chose is the pathway on which who are they? That is the companions of the Prophet. Allah is saying if then the disbelievers believe the way companions believe, then they would be indeed on the right path. If they don't follow that path, that is the path on which the companions are, then their Islam, their claim, their belief will be rejected. This is the ayah of the Quran. This is the this is the understanding of the ayah of the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah Surah number 2 ayah number 137. Now what was the character of some of the Sahaba before Islam reached them or before they embraced Islam? Now these were the people whom Allah chose for various reasons. Now before Islam came to them, they had a character which was not desirable. They were the people with a character that was not acceptable. They were a people with low moral values. They were a people of arrogance at the time. Let me count some of it. We would make sure that we do not take the name of any of the companions and relate them directly to any of these actions or the character because that would not befit us to do such a thing. But what we will do is just talk in general what were the errors and the mistakes and the disobedience of the people before they embraced Islam. Now some of them, to the extent, the people were known for their lying. They were liars. They were known for cheating. They were known for hypocrisy, for nifaq. They killed and buried their girls alive. We remember this. The Quraysh, the Arabs, before Islam reached them, they were the people who would bury their daughters alive in the grave. That was the level of ignorance and arrogance that they were living in. Furthermore, they would fight and kill each other for petty issues. They would fight and kill each other for petty issues. And that animosity between a family to another family, between a tribe to another tribe, between a, a group of people to another group of people would continue for generations. Would continue for generations. If I had an issue with you, and you kill me, then my son, my family would kill you. And your family would kill my kids. And then my next generation would kill your kids. This would continue for generations. This was their level of animosity. Moving further, they were alcoholic people. Alcohol, drinking alcohol, was not just their culture, was their bread and butter, was the national economy for them. Alcohol, they were indulged in alcohol. They would say that Arabs would have one of the best alcohol because they would preserve it for a longer period of time and then they would uh, produce it for the people. So it, was, it would be considered that they were the best alcohol producers in that society. Moving further, they were so, they were so arrogant and they were so immoral and they were so downtrodden that the superpowers of that time did not see befitting to rule them. Do you get my point? The superpowers of that time did not see it befitting to go and defeat them and to take over their country and to rule them. They would consider them to be so bad that nobody would want to rule them. That is how downtrodden they were before Islam reached. From an Islamic perspective, these were all sins. These were all ignorant arrogant actions and deeds and disbelieving um, uh, sins that they were committing. But the greatest of all was they were committing shirk by worshipping idols, making idols by themselves and placing them where? Placing them in a temple? No. Placing them in a church? No. Placing them in a synagogue? No. They were placing the idols to commit the greatest shirk inside the Kaaba 
that was the first house built for it by in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were so ignorant that they would make idols and place them inside the Kaaba to worship the idols, but not the one who is the owner of the Kaaba. That is how ignorant and arrogant was their character and their lifestyle. Now, why they were living this ignorant life? The reason I am mentioning all these weaknesses and disobedience and sins of the companions before they entered Islam or before Islam reached them is because some of us today, or rather let me put it this way, most of us even today would have some of those characteristics amongst us. If somebody denies that, then you are probably not talking uh, honestly. Every one of us has certain sins and certain actions of disobedience within our character. But now comes the lesson that I want you to take home from this session, which is in spite of all the sins that we have, in spite of all the weaknesses, the disobedience, the errors, the mistakes that we commit on a day-to-day -day, um, uh, activities and day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life of ours, can turn around, can switch around in a, in a glimpse, can switch around in a moment of time if we decide to submit ourselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the companions of the Prophet turned their lives when Islam reached them. Now let's see what they did once they embraced Islam or once they reached uh, with, with the truth of Islam. Now some of the companions, let me give you some aspects. Bilal radiallahu anhu, one of the companions who was a slave. You can understand what a slave would be in those days when they have no rights, they are meant to work for the master and the master has the right to kill them. There is no compensation, there is no a charge, there is no law that would punish the master for torturing or murdering the slave. The slaves were considered commodities. For example, you own something, you own a car, you smash the car, would you have to give it, you have to pay somebody if you own the car? Now, if you smash your own car, there's no penalty on you. But the slave would be considered in those days as a commodity. Under that torturous rule, when Bilal of Allah, and when he embraced Islam, let us look at the sacrifice they gave for the sake of Islam. Bilal of Allah was now being tortured for saying, La ilaha illallah. He was placed without clothes on his upper part of the body, on the hot sand of the deserts of Arabia. And he was being tortured with a piece of stone, a large piece of stone, a heavy stone being placed on his chest. Such that he would cry, he would shout, but he would continuously still say, La ilaha illallah. So they were sacrificing their entire life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now because they turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how sinful or whatever character they had before Islam, now when Islam came, they were ready to live and die for the sake of Islam. When they did this, we see the elevation that Allah took them to that higher level and we will see that towards the end. So Bilal was being tortured but he was ready to sacrifice, he was ready to bear the pain for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why would these people do that unless they loved Allah and his messenger more than themselves? Now comes the second stage. Now the Prophet sallallahu comes to know about the torture against Bilal What did the Prophet sallallahu do? He rushes to Abu Bakr and he said, Oh Abu Bakr, get me my Bilal. Now Abu Bakr he is one of the elites of the society. He is a rich person, he is a businessman, and he is one of the elites of the society. For the elites amongst the Arabs, the slave had no value. The slaves had no value for them. Now Abu Bakr, he is now a believer, a Muslim, a companion of the Prophet He rushes to where Bilal is being tortured, and he offers to purchase, to buy Bilal for whatever price they would put forward. Now the owner, the master of Bilal he puts a price higher than the market price for a slave in those days. Such that Abu Bakr would not buy him. But Abu Bakr immediately puts forward the amount that is being demanded, which is beyond the, beyond the expected norm. And the master or somebody who was there, they asked, how would you Abu Bakr pay such high amount for a slave like Bilal? Abu Bakr says, if today you ask me the entire wealth of Yemen, I would have been happy to give it away. 
because my messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told me to get me my bilad. The value of a slave who was a commodity in those days turned out to be greater than the value of the wealth of the richest nations of those days. And a companion is ready to sacrifice that wealth. A companion is ready to sacrifice his life and another companion is ready to sacrifice his wealth. Who are these people? The same people about whose disobedience and sins and weaknesses we just spoke. They tell when Islam came to them. Furthermore, we see Sumayya radiallahu anh, an old lady, when she embraced Islam, now she was tortured to the extent that she was brutally murdered. We call her the first martyr of Islam. We call her the first martyr of Islam. When people ask, you know, these days we have these anti-Muslims asking, what is the position of women in Islam? You know, in Islam, the woman is considered, or a woman has been given the position of the first martyr in Islam. That is Sumayya radiallahu anha. Was she in the battlefield? No. She wasn't in the battlefield to be considered amongst the martyrs, amongst the shuhada. Because that is one of the criteria to be a shaheed. But she wasn't in the battlefield, yet she was given the position of a martyr. Because she was martyred, she was killed, she was murdered because of her Islam. So we say that Sumayya radiallahu anha. Now she wasn't a believer before. But when she became a believer, she was ready to take on the sacrifice of giving her life for the sake of Allah and his message. Moving further, his, her husband was also martyred on the same place. Later on, her son was martyred in the battlefield. This happens to be the first family which was entirely martyred at the time of the Prophet The entire family of Shuhada, that was one of the first families. Going further, now the Sahaba, they were alcoholic as I said earlier, before Islam came to them. They would drink alcohol. Now we living in Australia, sometimes this becomes more reasonable for us to consider this with the people to whom we are talking here. You gotta understand when you're talking to somebody about Islam, it is important that you have empathy towards them. We understand where they are coming from. When you say to somebody alcohol is haram, which yes, Islamically it is haram, we're not denying that, but to a person to whom it's, um, it's not just a matter of a, a habit, it's not just a matter of drinking, a soft drink, it's a matter of culture. They would drink with their parents. So for them, how could they have anything wrong about having it? They would drink it on every weekend. They would drink it with their, with their families, with their relatives, with their parents, with, with anybody that they come across. And they would think that that is a good thing to have friendship with. So in that society, why we are giving this? Now let's see, so some of us might have such habits when we come to Islam. Or while we are planning to Muslim, be Muslim, we might still have those character embedded in us. So let's look at what the Sahaba did when Islam reached them. When the eye of the Quran was revealed that the companions were commanded that from now alcohol has been forbidden. The historians they record this, they say that when this revelation came, one of the companions of the Prophet rushed with this verse of the Quran to the companions of the Prophet who were still used to drink alcohol. As you know that alcohol was not prohibited in one go, it was prohibited, prohibited over stages. Now this was the final stage, that alcohol has been prohibited absolutely in its complete sense. Now once Sahabi reached the group of companions who were drinking alcohol at the moment. So now this is not a hadith but this is from the historians. They say that some companions were holding the, the glasses or the bottles, whatever you call today, they were holding filled with alcohol. Some were sucking alcohol from those bottles. Some had just drank it. Now this is, imagine in today's time, a pub. Where there are people holding the bottles, holding the glasses, drinking, and some have just drank. Now comes a companion and reads this ayah of the Quran to them. That Allah has not prohibited anything that intoxicates you. What would be our situation? Imagine, look at our character now. We know this is haram. We know riba is haram, we know telling lies is haram, we know cheating is haram, we know abusing is haram, we know accusing is haram, we know gambling is haram, we know all of these things which is halal and which is haram. Right? We are all aware of this. We know these commands. Now look at the companions, look at their character from the character of sinful lives. When they turn to Islam, look at their level of submission. When this command came to them and they were indulged, in other words, they were filled with alcohol to the heads 
And when the command reached their ears, the historians, they write that those who were holding the bottles, they smashed them. Those who were sipping it, they threw it out. And those who just drank, vomited it out. They said in the city of Medina, alcohol and all the pots that would hold alcohol was smashed and broken and alcohol would be pouring down the streets of Medina never to be returned even after 1500 years. It has never returned back to that city yet. That was the level of their obedience to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once they became the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The stories are many my dear brothers and sisters. One last one I would mention and with this I would come towards the conclusion. Imagine your enemy. I'm talking about a real enemy, a hardcore enemy. Imagine someone with whom you do have a real grudge. Someone who has hurt you, who has harmed you, who has abused you, who has done everything that would make you the most angry person on earth. Now I know some of you might be having some of your closest people around you, in your minds, right? We have this anger against so many people are against ourselves. They might be believers, they might be Muslims, they might be your family members and we have all this anger. But we are talking about real enemies who are your opponents. Now this, we are talking about the people of Makkah who kicked out, who tortured to death, who abused, who killed, who took away the wealth, the houses, the places of the companions while they were in Makkah. So the people of Makkah, they killed the companions, they took away their wealth and they were forced. They forced the companions of the Prophet to flee the city of Makkah. So some of them, they were sent by the Prophet to different places and finally the Prophet also went to Medina because of the level of persecution that was happening. Now the Prophet and the companions got the hand over Makkah now. We're talking about the conquest of Makkah. When the Prophet and the companions returned to Makkah, when they entered the city of Makkah, the people of Makkah, the army of Makkah, they were all dismantled. They decided not to fight because they realized the strength and the power of the Muslims who were walking, marching from Medina to enter Makkah now. So the people of Makkah who had persecuted the people of Medina and the people of Makkah, the companions who left Makkah, now all these companions who were, whose family members were tortured to death, whose wealth was confiscated, who were put into prisons, who were tortured and now they have an upper hand and they are now entering Makkah. What would you imagine? Imagine in today's scenario, if you allow me to be a little bit political, the scenario of Palestine and Israel. One of the groups gets the power over the other. What would you imagine? You know, you remember Hitler from Germany, which took, which led to the massacre of, of the, of the, and, and the Holocaust that happened at that time. You know what happened when Germany was taken over by the British and the other allies? They massacred the Germans. They massacred the Germans. So the Germans were massacring another group of people, but when the others got power over them, they massacred. So anyone who gets the power over the other, they would massacre the other group of people. Now remember this, now this is the Meccan people who were tortured, who were persecuted with the Prophet. Now they're coming back to Makkah. So the people of Makkah, the Quraysh, the disbelievers realized that today is the day of death for them. Because that's what they did. That is what they did and they knew that they deserved that. Now the people of Medina, Along with the people of Makkah, the companions of the Prophet, they are entering Makkah now. And they are shouting the slogan of revenge. We are here to take the revenge. Today is the day of flesh. Meaning today is the day of revenge and we will kill anyone and everyone who has tortured us and who has persecuted us in the past. Now when they were entering, the Prophet ﷺ changed the slogan. And the command of Allah for mercy was given. And the Prophet turned the slogan off. Which means today is the day of murder, today is the day of uh, blood, today is the day of flesh. And the Prophet converted it and said, Today is the day of mercy, today is the day of Rahmah. And the companions obeyed, complied to that. Would you be able to forgive the person who has killed your father? Would you be able to forgive the person who has killed your wife? Would you be able to forgive the person who has tortured your son? Would you be able to forgive the person who has kicked you out of your own home? It would be almost impossible and we have never seen such an example after that day till today by any nation or community or religious group. Such were the companions of the Prophet. So towards the end now I want to give you this, this message. That when the companions decided to submit their will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were not just forgiven of their past, they were not just clean from all their sins of the past, 
they were considered to be the best in the in the human race they were considered to be the superior most community and a group of people for the rest of the uh, mankind to ever come they were considered to be the best people to walk on earth after the prophet such that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them in the Quran, in Surah Al Bayyana, Surah number 98, ayah number 5 to 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. That Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. Subhanallah. Who are as humans to be pleased with Allah? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these words for the Sahaba, for the companions, and says, Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are these companions? Before Islam, they were sinful like us. But now they became the most obedient slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we too have an opportunity. Even if we are sinful today, even if we have been committing the worst of the sins and the crimes considered in Islam, even we have the same opportunity of maghfara, of forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will conclude from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where the Prophet said, as mentioned in both Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet said, uh, as narrated by Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anhu, the Prophet said, the best of the people are my generation. Then those who come after them, then those who come after them. So the Prophet Sallallahu said that the people with, at his time, that is the companions of the Prophet, they are the best of the generation to be ever living. So from them we take Islam, from them the message of Islam has reached us. They are the best role models for us after the Prophet Sallallahu So when they were sinful, but their lives could turn around, such that Khalid ibn Walid, who was an enemy of Islam at once, later when he embraces Islam, he is titled, the sword of Allah. So we too have that opportunity in Islam that if we are sinful today, we give up that sin and we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and become the favorite, become the most obedient, become the respectful slave and servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.